our Father and our God of heaven, your word says that for those that have turned to the Lord, that the veil is removed, that uh, that blindness that we once had, it's been removed, and we have eyes to see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Yet in Ephesians, it Paul's praying that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened, that we would come to know more of the blessings and the riches that we have in Christ. So, Father, we do see, but we want to see more. Father, as we're looking at Christ today and the work and the honor of Christ, I pray, Father, that you work within our own hearts to help us to love Jesus more. And, Father, if there be anyone here today that does not know Christ, that their eyes have not been opened. They don't know the honor of Christ. That worshiping Christ, loving Christ just seems strange, maybe even repulsive. Father, I pray that you open their eyes to see the glory of Christ today. So be with our time, we pray. We commit it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a passage in Revelation where we read of the angels, myriads and myriads of angels, that they cry out in praise to Jesus Christ. They say, Worthy are you, the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. The angels there are crying out and they are ascribing to Jesus all these, uh, all these virtues, all these blessings, and they're saying, Jesus is worthy of all of it. He is worthy to receive might and wisdom and blessing and power. He is worthy to receive all of it. But in our passage here, we see a, a powerful and a sobering contrast between one person who sees the worth and value of Christ and another person who's completely blind to it. We see Mary who sees the worth and value of Jesus and she ascribes it to, it in a, it to him in a lavish way. But then we see Judas Iscariot he looks really righteous. He appears very godly, but he doesn't see the worth and value of Jesus at all. Now, you remember, at this point here, Jesus has completed his public ministry. His public ministry essentially came to a, a close when he did his last sign, which was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. That demonstrated that he is the resurrection and the life. And the religious leaders, uh, we think amazingly, uh, they didn't respond by worshiping Jesus, but they responded to the resurrection here by wanting to kill Jesus. So they make a resolution, a plot to put Jesus to death. Jesus retreats, perhaps for a matter of a few weeks. We're not told exactly how long it is. It couldn't have been long. For a few weeks to a small town called Ephraim by the wilderness. And uh, some commentators suspect that's about 12 miles away from Jerusalem. Far enough away where, where he is safe from the threats of the religious leaders. Now in our passage, it tells us that uh, it's six days before the Passover. This is the great feast of the Jews. Now, uh, you probably heard that Jesus' ministry was a little over three years long. The reason why people think that is because this is either the third or the fourth Passover that John mentions in the ministry of Jesus. There's one, I don't have this written down, so it's off the top of my head. There's one in chapter 2, there's one in chapter 6, and there's one here in chapter 12, and they're all explicitly called the Passover. So there's at least three Passovers in Jesus' ministry. There's another one, another feast in John chapter 5 that is called the Feast of the Jews, but it doesn't say whether it's the Passover. So if this is the third Passover, Jesus had some time in ministry before that first Passover, and sometime after his resurrection here where he appeared for 40 days, you put that together, if it's three Passovers, then it's about two and a half years. If it's four Passovers, then his ministry is three and a half years. So this is the final Passover. What does Jesus do? What Jesus does is he heads to Bethany, which is two miles away from Jerusalem. He's going from Ephraim, and he's heading to Jerusalem. He's heading to the people that want to kill him. He's heading willingly as a sacrificial lamb to the slaughter. But on the way there... He stops in Bethany at the place of some beloved disciples. And in his interaction with Judas and Mary, we see a contrast between a heart that is blind to the worth of Jesus and a heart that prizes Jesus. 
So let me ask you, what is your view of the work of Jesus? In your heart of hearts, do you value and honor and love Jesus Christ? Well, let's work our way through the passage, and then I want to spend the bulk of our time on three applications. So first thing we want to do is just get our bearings here. Uh, get our bearings, and I want to do that by comparing this passage here with other accounts in the other Gospels. So there's the four Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record accounts of Jesus being anointed by a woman. But as we compare the accounts more closely, it becomes apparent that there's actually two different anointings that happened. Matthew and Mark are parallel passages to our passage here in John, which is Mary anointing Jesus with oil. But then in Luke, it's a different account with a different woman at a different time anointing Jesus with oil. And let me just mention some of these differences. First, the, the timeline's different. The anointing that takes place here with Mary, this comes in the last week of Jesus' ministry before he dies. But the anointing in Luke, that takes place right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry while John the Baptist is still alive. The location is different. In Luke, that anointing happens up in the north in Galilee, and the anointing here happens down south in Bethany. The person is, is different. In Luke, it's a notoriously sinful woman who anoints Jesus. But here in Matthew, Mark, and John, this is a faithful, beloved disciple of Jesus, Mary. And the objection is different, the objection that's raised. In Luke, the objection is that it's a sinful woman that's anointing Jesus. And Simon the Pharisee says, doesn't he know who's anointing him? But the objection in Matthew, Mark, and John is, why is Mary lavishing this expensive ointment upon Jesus? So there's, there's two different accounts. There's two different anointings, one at the front end and one at the back end of Jesus' ministry. Now, as we look at Matthew, Mark, and John here, they each add their own unique perspective. A couple examples. Matthew and Mark, they say that this anointing, this meal and anointing, takes place at the house of Simon the leper. And John tells us that Martha is the one that served the meal. Matthew and Mark tells us that Mary anointed Jesus' head, but here in John, it says that Mary anointed Jesus' feet. Matthew and Mark, uh, Matthew tells us that the disciples took offense at what happened, but John tells us that the one that objected was Judas. So how, how do we make sense of these differences here between Matthew, Mark, and John? Is this scripture contradictory in itself? Can we have confidence in what God's word says? Well, none of these differences are contradictory, are they? They, they all meshed together well. Martha helped serve the food at Simon the leper's house. If we don't know about Simon the leper, who he was, but if he was a leper that was healed by Jesus, he probably wasn't married. So he needed the help with the food, and Martha was more than willing to help. Uh, Mary anointed Jesus' head as well as his feet. In fact, in Matthew and Mark, Jesus says that, he, that she's anointing his whole body. And we realize that the amount of oil that's used it was about 12 ounces of oil. It could have easily went over his head and also his feet. So there's no contradiction there. And Judas was the one who primary, primarily objected. And when he did so, it appears that the other disciples joined in and said, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Now, I say all this for two reasons. One is because we are going to be looking at Matthew and Mark today. They add some different details that are really helpful for understanding this passage. But I also want to just make this point. We're in the Gospels. It's helpful just to make this point. What we see in the Gospels, it shouldn't under, undermine your confidence in the truthfulness and inerrancy of scripture, scripture. Instead, it should strengthen it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they aren't cookie-cutter copies of one another. They aren't the exact same account. If they were, then that would be only essentially one account. Instead, what you have is four writers, all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving their own testimony of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus with their own unique emphases and purposes. John has his purpose why he mentions Mary anointing Jesus' feet. We'll see that in a little bit. They all have their own unique emphases and purposes, but yet they fit together and complement each other perfectly. I think an example of this is if... If myself and John and Linda and Joe 
if we all saw something that took place in town here, say there was a robbery in town, and we, saw, we all saw it take place, and if the cops were talking to us wanting an account, if we all had the exact same story, what would that appear like? This is not a, this is not a unique testimony. But if all of our testimonies were a little bit unique, there's a different emphasis that we have, but they all mesh together perfectly, you'd say their testimony can be trusted. So why can you trust what the Bible says about Jesus? Because you have not one, not two, not three, but you have four eyewitness accounts of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, all under the inspiration of Jesus. So in our passage, Jesus stops in Bethany, and Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, they give a dinner for him there. Now, it is the custom in that day that the, the men would gather for the meal. They gather around the table. They didn't gather as we gather, sitting on chairs, but they gather reclining at table. You see in verse 2 that, that Lazarus reclined at table. The, the, the tables were very low, and they would recline at the table, and then their feet would be out from the table. So there would be at least 15 men at this feast. There would be Jesus. There would be Simon the leper. This took place at Simon the leper's house. There would be, uh, be Lazarus, and then there would be the 12 disciples, at least 15 men. But this was no ordinary meal. This was a meal of high celebration, gratitude, and worship. A matter of a few weeks earlier, Mary and Martha's brother was dead. But Jesus came, and he declared with a loud voice that he raised their brother from the dead. He's now alive. And Jesus is passing through here, and Mary, Martha, and, and, and Lazarus, they say, Jesus, we want to throw a meal of celebration to you. Meal of celebration. It's also a meal of worship. Because in Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, he revealed that he is the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. So this family, they love Jesus. Lazarus, he shows his love to Jesus by fellowshipping with him at the table. Martha shows her love by preparing the meal and showing hospitality. And then after we read about Martha and Lazarus in verse 2, look at verse 3. It says, Mary, therefore... Mary, therefore. We've read about Martha and Lazarus and their love for Jesus. Now it's Mary's turn. How is Mary going to show her love and worship to Jesus Christ? And she does it with an extravagant gift. Verse 3 tells us that Mary took a pound of pure nard. A pound is a Roman pound here, so it's not 16 ounces. It's 11 ounces, about the size of a can of soda. A pure nard, and, he, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, and then she took her hair and she wiped his feet and cleaned his feet. Now, nard, that's not something we're familiar with. Nard, nard is a sweet-smelling oil from the spike nard plant. And that's an herb that grows in the Himalayan mountains in India. Himalayan mountains in India. So just think of the geography here. You have Jerusalem and you have the Himalayan mountains. This would be this way for you. That's a distance of 2,800 miles. They didn't have any kind of fast transportation. There's no cars, there's no trains, there's no airplanes back then. The way that you would transport, you'd have to first extract all this precious ointment. Then you have to travel it all the way by, by camels or something like that. And so because of the precious value of the nature of the oil, as well as the long distance here, 2,800 miles, that's essentially from here all the way to Jeremiah Johnson in San Diego. That's how long it is. Because of the great distance, this was extremely valuable. Judah says in verse 5 that it was worth 300 denarii. 300 denarii. And a denarius was a day's wage for a common laborer. So today, if you take someone working 312 hour days at minimum wage here in Vermont, that would be $39,000. $39,000 that Mary takes of this ointment and she pours it out upon the Lord. This is all lavished on Christ in a moment, and then it's gone, all in high honor of Jesus. Now Judah sees this, and he objects. He says in verse 5, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And that seems plausible. Jesus, there's people that, they're having a hard time feeding themselves. They don't have proper clothing. There's, there's people that have needs. And Jesus, you know what God's word says about giving to the poor. For example, Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. 
And we as God's people are called to be generous to the poor. But this was not noble of Judas to say this. He's in effect saying, Jesus, you're not worthy of this extravagance. The extravagance that Mary is pouring out upon you, that's not fitting for you. It's not becoming of you. You're not, you're not worth that high honor. So whereas Mary had eyes to see Jesus' high worth and value, Judas was completely blind. And Jesus responds to Judas by rebuking him and commending Mary. Look at verses 7 and 8. He says, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. He's saying, Judas, don't prevent Mary from honoring you. You will not always have me. She is right to do what she's doing right now. And Judas, you object because you're blind to my high worth. So friend, do you see the worth of Jesus Christ? Do you see the honor of Jesus Christ? There's three things in our passage here, three, three words of application that we can look at that are meant to stir up your love for the honor and worth of Christ. So here's the first thing. Beware of the suicidal love of money that will keep you from valuing Christ. Beware of the suicidal love of money that will keep you from valuing Christ. Why did Judas not see the worth of Christ? The answer is, he loved money more than Jesus. That's why. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 tells us that he objected to Mary's lavish gift, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put in it. The so love of money, it characterized Judas's life. It characterized all of his life. As he sees this lavish gift poured out on Jesus, the thing that goes through his mind is inwardly calculating about the money. And it, it characterized Judas's past, this love of money. He was a thief, it says. He held the money bag. The money bag, he was the treasurer, in effect, for the, the 12 disciples. And as Jesus and the 12 disciples would receive some money, he held charge over that. He would distribute it. But we also see that he helped himself to it whenever he wanted. The love of money characterized his present. He objected to the expensive oil because he wanted a cut of it. He wanted Mary to liquidate the oil, to give the money to him as the treasurer. He would then give most of the money on to the poor, but not before he took some of it. He sees as Mary's pouring this out, he sees uh, an opportunity for gain being wasted. And love of money characterized Jesus' future, Judas' future, too. So it's his past, his present, and also his future. This is insightful, insightful here, what Mark says. Go to Mark chapter uh, 14. Look what he says in the parallel passage here. So Judas objects. says, why is this money not sold and given to the poor? Jesus rebukes Judas and says, what Mary's doing is exactly right and proper. Uh, so look at the rebuke in verse 6, Mark 4, verse six, 14, verse 6. It says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now, how does Judas respond to this rebuke, losing this money? Look at verses 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who is one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an offer. Jesus, you think you're going to keep me from this money here, this opportunity to take from Mary, to glean off of what Mary has here? If you're going to keep me from this money, Jesus, then I'm going to go to your enemies. I know they're looking for you. I know they've commanded that anyone that knows about your whereabouts to tell them. I'm going to go to them, and I'm going to see what kind of money I can get off of you. Judas did not value Jesus such that he was willing to sell his Lord for 30 Passage John read, Mark, Matthew 6, 24, says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Judas thought that he could serve two masters. He thought that he could serve his Lord, and he thought that he could serve money. But as time went on, it became apparent he was only serving money. Love of money and possessions and accumulation of wealth will blind you from the worth of Jesus. And that's what makes the love of money suicidal. It will destroy your soul. 
Look at 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 12. 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 12. There Paul writes and says, The godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many pains. Brothers and sisters, beware of the love of money. Beware of the love of money. Uh, it, it, it will make you, if you love money, it will make you wander from the faith like Judas, and you will pierce yourself with many pains. Judas pierced himself with eternal pains because of his love for money, and it will do the same for you as well if you're not on guard. Now here's the thing that makes love money so sinister, is that love of money often masquerades as virtue. It often masquerades as virtue. Judas said he cared for the poor, but that was really masking his own envy and his covetousness. He's presenting a godly front to other people, but inwardly there's envy and greed and covetousness. He objected to Mary using what was hers and giving it freely unto Christ. He said the poor had a right to what was hers. Judas wanted to confiscate what was Mary's, sell it, liquidate it, give it to the poor, but not before he gleaned off the top of it. All the while appearing righteous. Now we see this today in many ways, but one of the most common ways is in redistributionism. Redistributionism. It's the belief that wealth must be given, must be taken from one group of people and forcibly given to another. And it's usually done in the name of justice, or it might be done in the name of reparations, or in the name of Christian kindness. For example, there was a, a Democratic candidate in the primary cycle, this last election cycle, that proposed raising the top federal income tax to 52%. 52%. That's just federal income tax. That's not including property tax, state income tax, uh, FICA tax, as well as estate tax, and there's probably other taxes that I'm forgetting about. 52%. And this is done in the name of reducing wealth inequality. We hear this today, don't we? And so we say along with Judas, why is the wealth of millionaires and billionaires not taxed and given to the poor? Now this may seem noble. We might say, well, well, what's wrong with that? They have more wealth than what they know what to do with. What, what's wrong with this? Well, it's not noble at all. First, it's not loving your neighbor. It's not loving your neighbor. God warned the Israelites in 1 Samuel 8 that if they had a king like the other nations, that they would be cursed by the king taxing them at 10%. The king would have the audacity to call of his own citizens as much as God required other citizens. And you're probably thinking, I wish we could get back to the day of being cursed with only 10% tax. That would be wonderful. So that was a curse. That was a curse by God. So are we not hating our neighbors if we demand that the government takes from them five or six or seven times the amount of what God calls a curse? Secondly, this presupposes that the poor have a right to the wealth of the rich. It presupposes that the poor have a right to the wealth of the rich of the rich. Judas assumed that the poor had a right to Mary's wealth. But Jesus says, leave her alone. Private property is assumed in Scripture. It's assumed in the Ten Commandments. When God's Word says in the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, that presupposes private property. People have the ownership over their own property. It belongs to them. Otherwise, the command not to steal, it makes no sense. But Jesus also, uh, God also commands in the 10th commandment not to covet what other people have. We can't desire. We can't, we can't long for it. We can't say it's right for that to be taken and given to someone else. And it doesn't make it more righteous if we use the arm of the government to do that. We're forbidden from coveting what other people have. But thirdly, this fails to realize that giving to the poor is voluntary, not compulsory. It's voluntary. As God's people, we must give to the poor. We're called to have the first priority to give to the poor in our family, 
then to give to the poor in our church family, and then as we're able to give to the poor in our community, give to unbelievers. But God wants us coming from a willing, cheerful heart. Think of Ananias and Sapphira, where they sold that piece of property, they withheld part of it, and they gave it to the poor, but they said that they had given all of what they had received to the poor. God put them to death, not for their withholding some of that money, but for their deception. And listen to what Peter says to Ananias before Ananias is struck dead. He says, while it remained unsold, that's the field, did it not remain your own? It was your own, Ananias. It belonged to you. And then listen to this. And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? It was at your disposal, Ananias. Yes, God calls you to be free and generous and lavish and giving, but it's at your disposal. The poor can't say, I have a right to what Ananias has. It's at your disposal. So brothers and sisters, be on guard against the covetousness of wealth redistributionism. That's the air we breathe right now in America. And this is no different than Judas wanting to take from Mary and give to the poor. It's the exact same mindset. Make no mistake, this is not economic justice. This is the love of money, and the danger is it's going to blind you from the value of Christ. It's going to blind you from the value of Christ. So be on guard against the suicidal love of money in your own heart. Secondly, Jesus is worthy of your humble, sacrificial love. He's worthy of your humble, sacrificial love. So go back to John chapter 12. Jesus says, leave her alone. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So the poor are, are, are valuable. Jesus is not denigrating the poor. But he is saying, compared to the poor, I am of far greater value. And Jesus in his bodily presence will not always be with his disciples. And that makes Mary's lavish love upon her Lord all the more fitting. Mary was motivated by seeing the worth of Jesus Christ. He raised her brother to life. He raised her brother to life. How valuable is Jesus? He raised her brother to life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the Son of God. In him is the fullness of grace and truth. He is the bread of life. He gives living water to, to any and all that turn to him. They'll never thirst. To see and know Jesus is to see and know God. Jesus is of supreme value. So how can you measure the value of Jesus? You can't measure the value of Jesus. Jesus is of surpassing value. And therefore, there's no way to calculate the cost of love. Let me repeat that. If Jesus is of surpassing value, then there's no way for you to calculate the cost of love. You know, John Piper says, he says, there's no way that you could put your love on one side of the scale and say that Jesus is worth this much love. He's worth that much love and no more. You can't do that, can you? Jesus, he continues, Jesus is supremely valuable and wonderful and excellent. Therefore, he is worthy of your highest praise and costliest love. Amen? And therefore, Mary lavished Jesus with costly love. She poured out freely this expensive nard upon her Lord. This might have been the life savings of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then all their life savings. It might have been maybe a family heirloom that was passed down that was greatly prized. We don't know, but this was extremely costly, what Mary did. She freely anointed his feet and then wiped his feet with their hair. Oh, what's, what's that all about? What's going on there? Well, I, I think what's going on there is the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 5, that a woman's hair is her glory. A woman's hair is her glory. It accentuates the feminine beauty that God has given to women. And feet, uh, feet are not uh, prized highly in our culture today. Uh, but back in biblical times when you were wearing sandals and when you were outside doing manual labor and walking around, you would come in and feet were, that were the most lowly part of your body. Um, it would be the job of the servant to wash the feet. So what Mary is doing here is she is using the very best that God has given her um, to honor the most lowly of what Jesus had. She's using the very best of what God has given her to honor the most lowly of what Jesus had. She's taking her beauty and using it like a rag to exalt her Savior. And when she did this, the fragrance of the oil, it, it filled the whole house. And this is what a worshipful heart does. 
And they're someone that worships the Lord and honors the Lord. It's, you can't keep it to themselves. It has an effect. It just pours over into the lives of others. There's a fragrance from worshipful heart. So are you demonstrating a sacrificial love for Jesus that shows forth his great work? Now you might say, well, how do I do this? Jesus isn't physically with us. How, how do we show a sacrificial love for Jesus? Well, Jesus tells us how we are to do it, and we see it in John chapter 14, verse 15. To so turn to John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The primary way that you show your love to Jesus is by obeying him. By obeying him. And this includes all sorts of things. The first step of obedience for a Christian is to follow Christ by being baptized, by taking the sign of the covenant, taking that identification with Christ, publicly proclaiming uh, your faith in Jesus Christ. The first step of discipleship is baptism. Obeying Christ means putting sin to death by harboring no uh, secret evil to other people who don't know about, secret passions. It's making war on sin in your life. Obeying Christ means obeying his commands in the household. For husbands, it means loving your wives as Christ loved the church. For wives, it means submitting to your husbands as to the Lord. For children, for children, it means obeying your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And for fathers, it means raising up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Obeying Christ means obeying his commands for how you interact with others. It means putting away all bitterness and wrath away from you. It means putting on, being kind and compassionate, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. It means making the worship and fellowship of the church a priority because our Lord laid down his life to purchase the church. He loves the church. It means loving God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And we can go on and on and on with what Jesus has commanded us. Now you might say, but this is going to be difficult. This is going to be costly. This is going to be a sacrifice. Which Jesus would say, that's why. Right. That's why right. obedience is costly. Obedience is a sacrifice. So we're motivated to obey Christ because of the high honor and worth and value of Christ. We obey Christ because we say, Jesus is worth it. He is worthy of my costly obedience. So walk in sacrificial obedience and you are showing the worth of your Savior. And the third and final application here is set your eyes particularly on the value of the sacrifice of Christ. So Jesus says, so look back in chapter 12, he says, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Leave it alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Now, now this, is a, this is a difficult verse to understand. Um, some suggest that Jesus is rebuking Judas so that Mary may keep the oil, uh, the rest of it, for the day of his burial. She didn't pour it all out, but let her keep the rest for the day of my burial. But, but the problem with this is that Mark, in Mark 14, Mark says that Mary broke the flask and poured it all out on Jesus. She didn't hold anything back. So that can't be what Jesus means here. I think it's better to understand this as a shorthand phrase. I think there's some words that are missing. Uh, some words are left out, and we're meant to insert them. And, and we, we talk like this often. Uh, the example I thought of is if I say uh, there's a baseball game, and the Twins the twins hit 10 home runs, the Yankees 2. So that's a shorthand phrase. What, what am I missing? Now, buddy, you might be saying, that's a lie, because the Twins never beat the Yankees. They always lose to the Yankees. But what we're missing is the Yankees hit... Uh, hit two home runs. They, 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 they homer two home runs. So it's a shorthand phrase. I think there's words missing here that are meant to be inserted. Now, I think what's meant to be inserted is this. Leave her alone, Judas. Mary's ointment was so that she may keep it, or in anticipation of, the day of my burial. The purpose of this was so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. So the Jews, they would anoint a deceased body with ointment to show honor for the dead, as well as a way of masking the foul smell of the deceased. This was the anointing for burial, and this is what Mary's doing here. Now, if we take it that way, this matches perfectly with what Matthew and Mark says. 
Listen to what Mark says in Mark 14, 8. Jesus says, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. So what we see here is that Mary wasn't just honoring Jesus in general. She was honoring his soon coming death. Jesus, Mary wasn't honoring Jesus in general. Mary was honoring Jesus' soon coming death. She was anointing his body for burial. I think Mary likely knew that Jesus was about to die. Mary was perhaps the most attentive disciple that Jesus had. You read another passage that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to him. And Jesus had said many, many times that he would lay down his life. He prophesied it many times beforehand. Mary lives only two miles away from Jerusalem, and the religious leaders in Jerusalem are set to kill Jesus. Mary undoubtedly knew this. Jesus is coming from Ephraim on his way to Jerusalem, so what's going to happen? Mary knows Jesus is about to lay down his life. She loves and values her Lord, and the thought of him laying down his life is so precious that she is anointing his body before him. Brothers and sisters, how precious is the sacrifice of Jesus? 1 Peter 1 says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter says here that the blood of Jesus is far more valuable than the most valuable thing here on earth. Perishable things like silver or gold, Jesus' blood is far more valuable than that. He's a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we are to look at what Mary is doing here, anointing Jesus' body before and for burial, and this should lead us to value the cross. It's at the cross where the very Son of God laid down his life for us rebel creatures. It's at the cross where Jesus demonstrated supremely his love for you. you want to know of God's love? Look at the cross. It's at the cross that Jesus purchased redemption and freed you from your bondage to sin. It's at the cross that Jesus secured the forgiveness of sins for all who trust in him. It's at the cross that propitiation was accomplished. Propitiation was accomplished, which is uh, the means by which the wrath of God is turned away from us. That could happen because it was absorbed in Jesus Christ at the cross. It's at the cross that every blessing that God lavishes upon you was secured. Think of what Paul says in Galatians 6.14. He says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Far be it from me to boast in anything except for the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the center of all my boasting. That's the center of all my good, is what Jesus Christ did at hell. So brothers and sisters, let us honor Jesus Christ. Let us follow in the steps of Mary, and let us honor Jesus Christ. May God keep us from passions that blind us from him. These can be so so sinister. We 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 can be blind to them. But may God keep us from those passions that blind us from seeing the worth of Jesus. Jesus is worthy to receive all power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And all God's people say, Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, I pray that you would cause within our own hearts to see the value of Jesus. Father, we do proclaim he is worthy. He is worthy of our all. He is worthy of our love. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our obedience. And Father, I pray that we would present ourselves to him as living sacrifices and that we would walk in sacrificial, costly obedience to Jesus, showing forth the worth of Jesus to this world. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not know Jesus, that does not trust in Jesus Christ, that they're, they're not, uh, they have not been born again, Father, I pray that you would would point them to the love of God and Jesus Christ. That they would look to that they would look to Golgotha. They would look to the sacrifice of Christ. Um, That they would see the love of God there. The love of God for sinners. That they can be forgiven and cleansed and redeemed. Father, I pray that you'd help them to reach out to uh, to the elders in this church or to those they came with today. And I I pray, Father, that you give them the heart to seek Father, we honor and praise and lift up the name of Jesus. And we praise.
his name. Amen.